Sorry about that. This is God's prophecy picking back up that all the tribes of Israel would return from the Assyrian deportations of the tribes east of the river Jordan that were Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, and all of the tribes of the northern kingdom, and then the Babylonian deportations of the southern kingdom, Judah. It is a prophecy that is specific to the Assyrian Babylonian exiles in Judah. This prophecy was fulfilled according to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in their account of all 13 tribes returning to the southern kingdom of the lands of Benjamin and Judah to rebuild uh, the temple. That, that was the edict from, Cy edict from Cyrus of uh, Persia who had defeated the Assyrians and Babylonians. And he told the exiles, you of all his people return and build that want to anyway, and you have free, free passage. And they did, they all went back. Jerusalem is within the lands of Benjamin. And his lands are considered part of the kingdom of Judah, since that is where the kings of Judah rule from. Ten tribes being lost and not returning is a myth and a false teaching. Ezra, chapter 3, verse 1. When the seventh month arrived, the Israelites being settled in their towns, the entire people assembled as one man in Jerusalem. All of them. And it has to be all of them to be called one man Israel. Which escapes Tobias Singer, apparently. Well, not even apparently. <laughs> he just doesn't know. They've only gathered as one man two times. At Oren, when God called all the Israelites together. And then in Israel, we see they do it again to build the second temple. As a holy seed, God had forgiven the exile's sins. Just as he's doing again today, just as we have another temple to build. That's what the covenant of forgiveness is about. That's in Jeremiah, the covenant that starts, I'll write Torah on your heart, and all will heed me. You got to keep reading for, and because I will forgive your sins and remember your inequities no longer, no more. All of Israel had returned together to Jerusalem and Judah, mindful of all the imported Gentiles in the northern kingdom that were imported by the Assyrians, many of whom tried to stop the building of the second temple. 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. The first to settle in their towns on their property were Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants, while some of the Judaites and some of the Benjamites, there's you too, right? Well, how about this? And some of the Ephraimites and some of the Manasseites settled in Jerusalem. Do they read the Bible, these rabbis? I hear, I've heard Toby say 10 lost tribes. Well, here's four of them settling in Jerusalem of the exiles who Ezra says gathered as one man and he keeps referring to them as the Israelites. Well, Benjamin and Judah by themselves are never the Israelites. They're a part of the Israelites. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Judahites were the tribes with the largest allotments of the lands of Abraham. And Jerusalem is in the lands of Benjamin which is the smallest tribe. These are the ones that get mentioned. Why? They just mentioned those who were the largest and Benjamin's thrown in because that's where Jerusalem is. And that's where they're building the second temple. He was the smallest tribe, Benjamin. Ephraim and Manasseh were not lost tribes as many believe from writings outside of the Bible. There never were lost tribes according to the Bible. All 13 tribes returned and settled in new towns. The accounts of the deportations indicate there was not much left of the old towns. 
There is no account of how the new towns were settled, though it is unlikely it was based on prior ownership. The exile lasted too long for the deported owners to still be alive, and the tribes of the northern kingdom had to build new towns to live in. Isaiah 43, verse 14. Thus said the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I send to Babylon, I will bring down all their bars, and the Chaldeans shall raise their voice in lamentation. Babylon, the Chaldeans, Assyria, they were always fighting each other. This is God's prophecy that Assyria would be conquered by the Babylonians who were defeated by the Chaldeans and that he would raise up the Gentile anointed King Cyrus of Persia. The Gentile anointed King Cyrus. Persia to conquer them to clear the way for all the tribes to return. It is I, I who for my own sake wipe your transgressions away and remember your sins no more. That's Isaiah 43 verse 35. This is God doing this is in quotes, something new for the Israelites. This story repeats with the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 that includes sin forgiveness of the Jewish people that arise with Elijah and the angel of the covenant that you desire in Malachi 3. After the exiles of the Roman dispersals return to the land of Israel in a time to come, and that time is today. Jeremiah tells you, see, a time is coming, the land will bloom again, the ruined cities will be restored, and Jerusalem rebuilt. Then I will make a new covenant. Well, he has to come down here and get his prophet like Moses to deliver a covenant. Because he, he, he only speaks to one man at a time. And we saw that with the angel of the Lord in the uh, previous uh, verses to this. The Jewish people have returned from the Roman dispersal of them throughout the world. The diaspora, which means away from the promised land, to a land that lay desolate for more than 2,000 years until after the Holocaust, <clears throat> then they created the state of Israel in 1948. That's the beginning of the day of the Lord. All it's ever been is, you return, I'll return. They don't have to be sin free like Jews for Judaism teaches. Because God's coming with a covenant of sin forgiveness. <laughs> Y'all come back, make the land pretty again, make it bloom, and uh, restore your cities, rebuild Jerusalem. And I'm going to place my temple amongst you. That's the covenant of friendship. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, but it, who does it for him? His servant. He needed an ark. He had Mo, uh, Noah do it. He needed a temple. He had David and Solomon do it. But it has to be built. If Elijah does not clear the way and that temple's built and God is here, there will be utter destruction to the land of Israel. And that's on plenty of tapes. It's his last words to the prophets. Utter destruction. Build the temple, and the covenant of friendship says you'll never be defeated and dispersed again. Jeremiah 31 says that too when you rebuild Jerusalem. But the caveat to that is you get the temple built. Okay, now Zechariah, and this is where Rossi's trying to figure out why. Well, here, I'm sure God wrote it. Zechariah is in Jerusalem, and the construction of the second temple is about to begin. Isaiah has written God's words of sin and forgiveness, which would have removed the curse long before this, and the angel of the Lord proclaims, O Lord of hosts, how long will you withhold pardon from Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, which you placed under a curse 70 years ago? <coughs> this vision of Zechariah and the words of the angel of the Lord threw the man standing in the myrtles regarding the curse 70 years ago is to make 
Zechariah think and try to understand why the angel of the Lord would say this. From his perspective, the curse was lifted as he was back in Jerusalem with all the tribes preparing to build the second temple. The vision is for Zechariah to find out how and when the curse was lifted. The writings of Isaiah. Rashi says in his, oh, here it is. Rashi says in his introduction to Zechariah, chapter 1, the prophecy of Zechariah is extremely enigmatic because it contains visions resembling a dream that requires an interpretation. We cannot ascertain the truth of its interpretation until the teacher of righteousness comes. Again, that would be me, and there is your answer. I will put my heart to recounseling the verses one by one according to the interpretations that resemble it and following the interpretation of Jonathan. That's right, disciple of Hillel. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah revealed that the 13 tribes did not know they had been forgiven and their sins to be a holy seed in the building of the second temple. They did not know. You can't just read it. If people know they have been forgiven and have a clean slate, from past transgressions against God and his laws and commands, they are more likely to stop their sinful ways and abide by his laws in the future. The scroll of remembrance, Malachi 3. God says, for this day, because people do not heed me. The, even though in the covenant, the new covenant, he says, and all will heed me, he knew better than that. And he's straightening it out. He's straightening out the concept of the day of the Lord for that matter. And these are his final words to the prophets. And there's a video on that. The scroll of Isaiah needs to be found and interpreted by Zechariah and the religious leaders so they will know of God's forgiveness of their sin. God will be returning before the temple is built to test the devotion of his righteous servant and make him suitable for his purpose which might prosper by his fire of refinement, which you can find in Jonah, Job, Ezekiel, and it's in 53, although not by name. Isaiah 53. This would, uh, the purpose that might prosper, that includes the building of the third temple for God's return. This would begin when his spirit alights upon the anointed one, Isaiah 11. His presence with his righteous servant will be necessary for the temple to be rebuilt. Islam will not freely hand over the third most holy site to Israel and abandon the Dome of the Rock Mosque. But this doesn't matter. God does not want it on the Temple Mount because of that problem right there, the mosque. Jordan controls it, and it's tiny with Islam, and most importantly, it's too small. But it has to be on Mount Zion, which I believe is the mountain that Jerusalem sits upon. Anywhere up there, there's got to be a large tract of land. With God is the angel of his presence when he, who is already on the way as the angel of the covenant who will arise before Elijah. I'm Elijah also. Four righteous servants to come. One description of a righteous servant. I handle all the duties. This book was dictated to me as the Torah was dictated to Moses. It makes me the prophet like Moses. There's no exodus to deal with. That's the only unique aspect of Moses uh, outside of being a prophet. Who arise before Elijah and will be with God. And Elijah is mentioned in, he's the messenger that is to clear the way. It's not David. It's not Moshe. Although they're one and the same person. And will be with God before God's righteous servant offers himself for the guilt of sinning of the Jewish people. 
Isaiah 53, 10, he offers himself for guilt. Sin that has been forgiven and does not exist. God is just testing him and his devotion. They need to be told, of course, and, and that happens when we get the books published. When the man described in Isaiah 53 makes his offer of his self for guilt, he becomes God's righteous servant, God's servant David, a shepherd, the messenger Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. He must pass the test first. The prophet like Moses will have other similarities to Moses beyond writing God's words at his command in the description. This is from, well, I'll tell you when I get through. Quote, this is really interesting. This is about Moses and the old sages and rabbis from long ago. To the greatest degree possible for any human being, Moshe's identity and existence became one with the Creator. And I can understand that. He surrendered himself to God to the extent that our sages say the Shekinah, the divine presence, spoke through Moshe's throat. And I've shown you on many videos how he can speak through me. That's from the Zohar. He was God's variable mouthpiece on this earth. That's from the Sefer Hasikos. The prophet like Moses will also have the answer to these questions. The great Jewish philosophers try to answer the question of how Moses heard God literally. Some insisting that God spoke actual words and Moses heard them with his ears. While others suggest that Lord's, that God's speech was communicated silently to Moses' intellect and only uttered in sound by Moses himself. Memonites, even as he affirmed the communication between God and Moses as a fundamental Jewish belief, ultimately conceded the mysteriousness of the process. The entire Torah reached Moses from God in a manner which is figuratively described as speech. But no one has ever known how that took place except Moses himself, whom that speech reached. That's commentary on the Mishnah in the Sanhedrin chapter 1. He did not hear it with his ears. Spirit of God alights upon you. God is in his spirit. So God alights upon you too, his presence. And he manipulates your mind such that you can hear the conversations between yourself and God, between yourself and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. Two divine beings. Immediately, the man of Isaiah 11 becomes a man of divine beings, just as all the prophets of the Jewish people were. Men and divine beings. The man that Jacob wrestled with is not an angel. He's just a man that the Spirit had lit upon and God had lit upon and had him wrestle with Jacob and then God spoke through him. The angel of his presence is the angel of the Lord. You've seen two, two situations where God can speak through him at the burning bush and at the myrtles. Okay. And, and this is covered. This this with Ezekiel, it's covered in other videos. Okay, we're going to be re moving on to chapter 7. The host of the Lord's host. And of course, I've done this before. But we went back through and cleaned up all those old ones that were in such terrible shape. Did the 50 some odd chapters uh, with all the part 1's and part 2's. It came up to 67 now. Um... But we've already reposted them about six or seven times, and they're already starting to show a little wear and tear. So we're going back and we're doing it again, all 50, and trying to keep away from parts one and part two, although I, did, I, did, I knew I wouldn't get it with chapter six. I knew it would be two parts. Okay, next up, chapter seven. <laughs> 